guys. Thank you all for being here. Uh, if you guys were here a little earlier, we were all wondering when anybody would show up. <laughs> all, really all the way down. Yeah, we actually got people using folders. It's awesome. Thank you for being here. Um, and welcome to the first annual meeting of the uh, your Eugene McDermott College of Um You see, of course, the plug for my firm, Mansfield, and Tinker and Cox. If you listen to NPR when the results truly matter. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for breakfast. As we move forward, you guys should think we can start pulling money in from all sorts of places whenever we need it. Um, today's, we're going to keep this efficient. We're going to keep this short. We do have to be done <laughs> by uh, 9.30, I believe, is the, uh, is the right time. But we'll walk through um, really today's goal. Well, I'll walk you through this one. We all know who that is. Um, so we'll open things up on the right note. Um, we got, I, I think many, some of you have heard, some of you know about this. Mrs. McDermott wrote a book, and uh, she allowed us to use her introduction to kind of open the meeting uh, to welcome you guys. And this is the introduction to her book, Reflection, which Dina will um, read for us. said that nothing lasts except pain. As I reflect on the artist whose work my husband, Eugene McDermott, and I have collected, I feel a sense of permanence. Monet's nuanced vision of his pond at Duverney or Miss O'Keefe's interpretation of the red hills of New Mexico are as lasting as anything. The impact that artists make on our consciousness is so lasting that many decades later, observers of a fine French morning with a certain quality of life recall Monet, and people enjoying a vivid southwestern landscape remark, a slight Georgia O'Keeffe. The works that Dean and I collected have brought us a lifetime of bountiful and varied experiences. Now, as they move to a permanent home in this young museum of art, I find myself not only reflecting on the artists whose works have filled their lives, but on their histories and the ways that they entered and changed our lives. Art took us around the world and brought the world to us, the collectors we met, the dealers we relied upon, the visitors we welcomed into our home, and the artists we loved all became part of our world and ours. For years, I had thought of writing about our collecting, but hesitated, even though it was something I wanted to do and felt an obligation to do. Why an obligation? Dean's generosity and the supportive role he played for me, combined with the fun we had, the enrichment of our home, added up to a special art story that I realized only I could tell. For many years, I'd work on this personal story a little, but then I would defer. The discipline of writing, after decades spent away from it, was not easy. There was always something else to do, reading, entertaining guests. I was so overwhelmed with the enormity of my subject matter, meaning art. Both seemed too vast for someone of my meager, rusty, literary ability to try to capture in terms. However, at 99, it was now or never. To help you understand our collection, the ways it was formed, I believe it is important to attempt to describe this generous, kind, always curious man, my husband. He touched many lives with his spirit of giving. His scriptural interest centered on education, medicine, and science, not on art. We purchased our first pictures because I loved them, and he liked them. Gradually, as we acquired more, his interest grew. Our best purchases were made when we were both taken with a potential acquisition. Living with the actual acquisition, which we did for many years, enriched the two of us. Whenever my husband made a gift to any person or project, he accomplished it swiftly, without thought of what the stock market was doing or what the tax advantage might be. Dean wanted people to benefit. Improving the quality of life for others was his goal. He believed financial success should be shared for the good of others, and he lived this belief each day of his life. Letters of appreciation for recipients were unnecessary for him. If received, they were forgotten. He was not like me. I have always felt that thank yous bring another satisfaction to giving. Once, I listed just some of his current donations. Because of you, I'm used to the affluent society, I said truthfully. I hate to run out of money. We're going to run out of money before, I'm sorry, we're going to run out of time before we run out of money. <laughs> so, with the hope that future visitors to the Dallas Museum of Art will find these personal recollections and reflections about our art of interest, here goes. 
Margaret McDermott, Dallas, Texas, did not hear. Thank you, Gina. Um, Steve, this is Gabriel. She invited us to lunch about four or five or nine, I think, a few weeks back, and she had, had us read that for the first time, and she was touching. Um, and I think she wants to uh, publish after she passes. Um, because apparently there are still copies of that book still. But that was really nice, and she shared it with us a few weeks back. Um, all right, guys, to the, the nuts and bolts. Uh, very briefly, we're a nonprofit corporation in Texas, organized legally, uh, officially uh, formed in March of 2012. We approved bylaws a few months after that. Many of you guys were involved in drafting, editing, or approving that at some point. Um, from the bylaws, of course, that's everything that Bill is harassing. They are in your book, um, and I encourage you to, to read them in full every page. Um, you'll find at the very outset the mission of the association, um, which, as you'll see, is threefold. To improve the quality of the student experience by mentoring and empowering future generations of scholars. To provide community and direction by advising the program and participating in the selection of incoming classes, so there is, um, as well as outstanding candidates to lead the program. And then three, to contribute in collaboration with the with UTD, um, to the UTD Alumni Association for the progress and development of the University of Texas at Dallas and the Greater Dallas Community. Those are kind of our, our foundation, that's kind of our guiding light in some sense, and that's led to more that many years of endless calls and site meetings and eventually bylaws and now the association. Um, my brief message before I turn it over really to, to the heart of, of the work of the association is, uh, at least the way I see it is we have to synthesize one of the most important things we can do. Number one is obviously support the program and everything that means, whether it's just participating, mentoring, donating, whatever we can do. Um, and number two, bringing our network. Uh, and, and obviously, I mean, I think our greatest power is going to come from how close we knit these people's association, how much we communicate, how much we help each other. And uh, talking to some of the seniors last night, um, I want to make sure that we all think about how we welcome them as they come into the association. And the message is clear. Look, we're all in this together. We're here to help you. We're a bit of a family. Um, and I think together we can accomplish a lot of things. Um, today's goal, we're going to let you know what we've been up to. Uh, we have committees, a number of committees, that each do their own special functions that also work together, of course. And, um, and then we also want to listen to you and your questions. We're going to try to move through the committee work reasonably quickly, just a couple minutes, two, three minutes per committee, uh, so you guys know what's going on. And then after that, we'll open the floor for some comments, for questions, um, also limited to, uh, I think, 10 minutes. Um, with that said, we'll start walk, walking through each of these uh, committees. First up, Mr. All right, so you've all been pestered hopefully many times about donating. So as Andre said, you know, there's sort of different parts of the association. Uh, you know, the way, the way I see it, the way development sees it, is that uh, we have to have three components. One, passion, one vision, and one commitment. So we're obviously here uh, in the first part. That's not a question at all. Um, Aiden loved the program so much, he bought two plane tickets to get here. Uh, <laughs> you can ask him that story later. Uh, so that, that's the, the first part, and I think we've got that covered. The vision piece is the association as a whole. So we need to figure out what we're doing, and the idea behind that is we know going forward that the university's position is going to be changing. Um, Austin, obviously, you know, could be here for a while still, could not be. Um, same with a lot of the program staff and some of the P5 support. Uh, and it's our goal and our responsibility then to ensure as a body that we have a say within the university and within the program that we can continue the founding visions of Mr. McDermott and as well as, as what we see as the best representation. So we need to have that vision. And then in order to do that, it comes to the commitment part. As Andres was saying, you know, there, there are two pieces to that. One is just participation. So you're obviously all here today. Um, that's crucial. It's going to be essential that we're involved with reading all the applications going forward that were part of the, uh, the interview process um, and, and helping expand and grow from a uh, helping with internships and jobs as well as recruiting future scholars. Um, and then obviously here from development, you know, our, our big part is, is giving back financially. Um, we can only do so much by getting involved 
but obviously as we continue to grow, there are only so many of us that could really be here on finals weekend. Um, so we need to think about this sort of five, 10, 20 years down the road when there may be a thousand alumni, uh, and really we only probably need 30 or 40 here at these weekends. So the other way to ensure that we have a voice on campus is to prove our commitment uh, financially. So that's the Project 100 that you've been well aware of. I trust seriously that everybody who's sitting in this room has clicked on the donate button already. Uh, if you haven't, don't tell me and do it at lunch. Um, <laughs> and we have uh, percentage donations here so we can talk about it by class. Um, and again, this isn't to <laughs> indicate the strength or the weakness of any particular, but more just to see where we are. I think there's- I see the numbers here at the bottom. Oh, one. So that's an overall percentage of about 65. Yep. So uh, we had gotten about 90% commitment. So, oh my goodness, hello. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, jumping ahead. Clearly, I'm talking too long. Uh, that, uh, so we've gotten about 90%. I think a lot of you were part of that of reaching out to your class. Uh, so there are, there are only two classes, and they are, haven't even gotten to 90%. They're, they're hovering around that line. So those of you that are in, any of the other classes, uh, please reach out to other alumni. Uh, and I know a lot of them are, are busy. They may not even be within contact. I know we've had some trouble even finding people again. Uh, but really, it, it's a pretty straightforward process of just going to the website. There's a donate button. Uh, I know right now it's set up through Google Wallet. I don't know in the future if we have any plans of. Yeah, it's simple Google Wallet. Okay. If somebody else takes over and runs the Google Wallet, it's simple, secure. Uh, I'm assuming that if people were really crazy, they could probably write a check to the Alumni Association. Uh, but it is an option if you're really against Google. Um, so that there, there really aren't a lot of excuses. And, and what we're asking for, you know, minimum $10, $5, or something. I think we've had pledges up to $1,000 at this point. Uh, and going forward, obviously, we're looking at the $100,000 mark. So here in a little bit, we're going to go out to the trellis. We'll have a naming ceremony for one of the ponds, uh, and that naming right costs $100,000. So we've pledged that to the university over a five-year period. Uh, as you know, Mrs. McDermott sort of kicked us off with a $50,000 endowment. Um, we, do, we don't want to put that all into the, into the pond. I mean, we I guess had to maybe, but we really want to set aside a good chunk, and that, that was a discussion that we had within the committee. Yeah. I mean, it would, it's a lot of pennies. <laughs> it would be a lot of fun. <laughs> We're thinking you only probably need five thousand dollars for that. You don't need the full fifty. Uh, and I asked Dr. Daniel, uh, you know, food coloring of orange and green was maybe somewhat frowned upon, um, but that may be again, you know, fifty thousand dollars can convince a lot of people. <laughs> so I'll keep pushing that. Uh, but obviously, then for those mathematically challenged, twenty thousand dollars a year. Uh, and ideally, it's going to continue to grow. So this year, you know, may not be 20,000 with the idea that five years from now, obviously, the alumni base will be significantly larger. Uh, part of it also is that we need the funding as an organization to function. Uh, and more importantly, we need to start our endowment. So the, the idea here isn't just to write, raise funds and give it right back. Uh, we want to start building our own capital uh, that will build its own fund. And going forward, interest off that fund, just like the McDermott program itself, can be funding study abroad programs, can be funding research, um, can be funding any variety of things that the board would discuss and vote upon. So uh, that's sort of the nutshell. Uh, again, we're going to have uh, about thank you, Caden. Yes. Has an agreement been reached on how many cents of every single hundred dollar will go to the endowment? Yeah, and that's a great question. At this point, not specifically. I think the Somewhere between people on the lower end maybe wanting about 25%, some on the upper end were hoping for 35 to 40%, and that'll be continually discussed in, uh, in committee meetings going forward. We certainly love to open that up for discussion as well, uh, but this is probably the only time I think we want to do that now at the end. But, okay, so we'll save that, but think about that. Think about your favorite number in that range and, uh, and let us know. So, uh, 
Any other questions? Also, we'll save that for the discussion period. At this point, we'll move forward to the uh, to the next committee. I was just uh, going to point out that I guess on Wednesday night, the Gibson University Summit for Racial <laughs> Dynamics is holding. Yes. So anyone who doesn't know how that money, that hundred thousand dollars, is broken down, they can check that out. And the board of directors list is in here as well, so that has all the contact information. Uh, <coughs> feel free to reach out to us. And any hate mail in the organization has Andre's personal address. I'm done in my mail. Great. Recruitment. Um, we are in charge of both recruitment and selection. Thank you all for participating in the selection process. Um, a couple of new things. A lot of you, if you are in, uh, reviewed applications beforehand and helped cut, uh, cut the 500 or so applicants down to 60, 58 we have now. Um, further, we have alumni representative on the selection committee, um, that's Eric, this year. And going forward, we have been given the, we are going to be developing the process of nominating our own disadvantaged um, alumni this year uh, at the Alumni Association. Also, um, we are doing recruitment, and in the next couple of months, we're going to start asking alumni to start going to their local schools, wherever you are around the country or world. And also, um, there's some thoughts of when there are uh, new scholars that have been given uh, the, the awards right now, um, we will, if there is an alumni in their area, we're going to try to send that alumni to their local school's awards night and uh, we can congratulate them. And, and it's a really good way to connect alumni with incoming scholars and also uh, recruit for next year. And look at that under time. I <laughs> think we have Thank you. 
two scholarships that are in the Indian district. So this is the fourth year of the alumni program um, doing mentoring. It's now absorbed into the alumni association, which is fantastic. Um, Vice Michael and Reverend Lee Mitchell right now, again, intermittent <laughs> work. Um, but if anyone's interested in getting more involved in it. Um, I'd just be curious, how many of y'all are mentoring right now, or mentoring the semester? Um, so it's, it's not a, mm, so it's good, it's great, because we have 26 <laughs> people. Um, <laughs> like, I always blame Benedict for that. <laughs> Some of the scholars now have two mentors. Um, so the program is really rolling. If anybody has feedback for me, I try and check in throughout the year. But um, we seem to have, have been well received by the current scholars. And um, it's, it's nice to see my mentor from our first year doing it is now mentoring someone else. So it's um, coming full circle already. And I think especially as the program um, increases in size, like I was saying, it's going to be um, even more important. So. Does that mean it's something that we would continue with them? Over the, over the course of one four-year session, you could mentor three different so people. That's the idea. Um, but the idea is also that you can maintain the relationship if it's a good fit. Um, we don't want people to feel obligated to engage with someone who just you know, isn't a good match. But the hope is that um, you know, it, it kind of establishes a network as well. So even if I'm not mentoring Eric, that's a pathetic take, um, he knows that, that his friend is, is working with me and that I have a policy degree and he sends his friend to me. So part of it is recognizing that um, Sherry and Rena and Molly have great relationships with most of us, but it's a, a little bit cumbersome, especially the increase in size. So using the other mentors as a connector um, with the current scholars and, and doing so that everybody knows how to get in touch and what it is that they really need to do. Well, that's super important.
a lot to the to the university. So um, that's most of my update. Michael, ha- do you know how many students we currently have? We're just under twenty thousand students. Okay. Um, our freshman class is projected to possibly be more than two thousand uh, this incoming fall class, mm-hmm. and it will be the highest average of the of the three four. <laughs> the the AES honor scholarship the average SAT score is a fourteen ninety. Uh, to get that top tier AES honor scholarship. So just to show you the the caliber of students that we're recruiting, um, not just from the Dallas area, but uh, our reach is really going uh, national as well. So we need to celebrate. Thankfully, we did not apply with these other students. <laughs> Association, not only with the program, but with UT Dallas as a whole. We really want to make our mark as someone who impacts this university. And so I've, a lot of my work is in collaboration with a lot of other committee members. So I've worked with the 100, the 100K donation, a lot of the things we're doing today, and a lot of the other projects that you've heard about. And I've been working a lot with members of the university, and they've all been extremely excited about our association. I even spoke with the alumni with Airability, for those who, who know her, she's, she's in charge of alumni relations on the personal level. And um, we talked about the future of a potential alumni association for the university. And so there's a potential plans to do that after the campaign is over. And hopefully, whoever will be in my position, or at least with the board in the future, will work with Erin and work with the development office on those goals, because I think it would be great for us to be involved with that. Um, with that, I'll leave you with a reminder about getting alumni ID cards. This is actually uh, the Pepe's idea. He's holding one up right now. Um, I know it's very difficult with our timing, and some people, most people will, will probably struggle to go, but if you could stop by the Comic Center between, t- today, unfortunately, they're o- only open between 10 and 1. But <laughs> if maybe you have five minutes to take a bathroom break, it doesn't really need to go to the restroom, then go ahead. <laughs> Um, about the uh, the cards, they literally take like two minutes just to track you, take your picture, and then the other two minutes are for you to print. And they'll be accepted. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. All of your paperwork should be processed. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Will they let you retake the picture? Uh, so what? They say you should return. No. The Strategic Interviews Committee is something we formed to try to help us get this vision. So, as you know, the program started and a lot of the people over time have started to not be uh, as involved as they used to be. Either they've moved or they've retired, things like that. And what we're trying to do is capture that original vision of the program and preserve it for future generations so that as we continue to try to guide the program as we said we'd like to, uh, we have kind of those foundational principles of what makes Maker what you are, what the program should be, what the program shouldn't be, uh, that sort of thing. So what we need is we need you guys to try to uh, help us interview some of these people in a really informal setting. Just sit down with them, have lunch, talk about a few things, uh, regardless of topics, to try to help you uh, get started. And all of it's completely confidential. We, are try- we want to get as candid of responses as we can from these people, so we want to know what's gone well so far, what hasn't gone well so far. That's the one that they're told candid thing that will help them. So that's really all we're trying to do. Zoom is doing one next week, uh, but we really need a lot more volunteers for that. We really like to have people who have a little bit of a a connection already with this person feel so comfortable talking to us. So if you are interested at all, email me, email Alex, send our request. Can you tell us who you not knowing about our existence or not and hoping to just get the big tip. Um, but we would like to, of course, get, you know, Doc Aaron and uh, some others.
So but we haven't sent out any mailers. We don't intend to send out any mailers. We're not pulling any mailers. Um, we want to make sure we use your con contribution in the most efficient way possible. And I don't think hard copy scan mail is very effective in these times. Um, one other aspect in terms of current scholars contacting us or finding people in certain fields is the sort of where are they now section of the website, like a class by class page on the website. Someone from email me yesterday that said my stuff's out of date. So just go on there, find your name, and if it's out of date or you want to add something, um, let me know. actually on his way here. I'll make it very brief, just so everybody knows. Um, currently in our bank account, there are $33,228.47. Uh, that is missing uh, maybe two or three thousand dollars from recent contributions. Yeah, so uh, people cut us a check every month, basically. That's right. We started, uh, so that, that brings a total up to around thirty-five, thirty-six thousand dollars $36,000. We have... Sorry, this is after the 20 that we started. Yes, yes. We're given how much already? $25,000. We make the first $25,000 payment to secure the name on the pond. Um, and from here on out, obviously, it's, it's $20,000 is probably enough eventually. Um, so that means we get an eighth and the other twenty five dollars is going to go to Google Correct. Yeah. Something like 7%. <laughs> 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 now, I'll tell you, the success thing comes from the fact that Google takes like 1 or 2% of right. all contributions. The more we contribute, the less Google <laughs> Which is with any credit card payment system. Yeah. Right, right. The uh, the only expenditures we've had so far are obviously that first donation, and then last night about maybe three hundred dollars for the um, for the happy hour. Um, I think we've limited how we spend the money. We're going to be very careful, and I think until we set up an endowment that ensures we have something going forward, we will be very careful stewards. I think of whatever money comes. In. To answer your question, we've had about. We have just over ten thousand dollars of actual contributions from the fund. The current, current one, that's right. Guys, floor is open for you guys to ask questions, to talk about anything that came up, um, to keep things moving. Yeah, hands are probably useful. So let's go. Okay, so if we've already given twenty-five thousand to the naming pool, does that mean we have seventy-five thousand left for the expanding balance that we have? We have seventy-five thousand left over over the five-year period. Okay. Four. I'm going to guess you might know this. Uh, how much less from what was pledged? Like, what's the difference between what was pledged and what we've gotten, do you think, so far? Um, some people have pledged amounts, and some people just pledged that they would. Oh, okay. we, we don't have an exact number as to how much we were expecting to get in. Okay. Uh, of the people who pledged, we had you know just over 60% who gave to the pool. Our, our hope was at least in the first year to have the $10,000 start. Uh, knowing that the first year is probably a little bit harder to get going. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it wouldn't need $20,000 a year. Um, that was, and up to 10000 was even before we knew the donor was sending the check. But I think we're on a good start. You know, we're a little bit shy still, I think. But as the alumni base grows and people get more involved, and hopefully as you, you know, progress in your jobs and... Um, we're, we are over 10, so we're yeah. We're also a great job. And the reality is we haven't done anything yet. And even without really doing anything, people have topped up over $10,000. And that's pretty fantastic. It's really nice because I think uh, Andres gets alerts and I get alerts that people contribute. And we haven't shared the amounts. We won't share the amounts with people until we share this with the actual donors. Contributions are treated confidentially. We don't expect it to be executive committee or to uh, association. Um, and I'll note, after we have some feedback, I'll tell you guys a little bit about some of the plans to kind of make this broader than just asking our alumni to contribute. Uh, what we're kind of thinking on that. I want to talk about uh, two other things. One is a question and one is a statement. The question is, have we worked out a way so that the money we contribute to the program for our own use <laughs> contributes towards the $100,000 contribution? Basically, does the $100,000 contribution have to come with dollars we actually write in checks to each of you and say, here's the money? Because if we're talking about grants, committees, or things like that, that's the next. We, the answer is no, we have not. We right now, the, old, the understanding is um, we, we write a check to the university, which goes into a particular fund. There is a gift agreement. You know, it's not like we're going to sue it if we don't hold it. They've been very flexible in, uh, in working anything out uh, that we ask of them, really. Uh, but, but that is definitely something that we should work on uh, to 
figure out, especially for the future, what counts as a powder versus what counts as a liquid. Mm. Mhm. Yeah, that's a really good point. I guess it depends. Which is it, so, like, if I personally give to you then I give. Alumni association is an alumni association that gives to one university. And other university as you know, you mentioned the other day. Metrics of, like, how many of their alums have given do I need to also give to this university and make sure they count? You know? Yeah. No, that's a great question. Like, there's a guarantee alumni count as In addition to letting Aaron know, Aaron Conley he may know um you know, he's he's trusting that we will give him accurate numbers, so That's awesome. We will I'll make the, I'm certainly I haven't given my name to anybody, so if somebody in this job is uh someone's giving their name to Aaron Conley, then you keep an eye on him? Yeah, he, he wanted at least annually and and uh we thought maybe probably quarterly or semi-annually of saying these are the new people that have contributed. Cuz you're in charge of it. I don't have the names. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So, <laughs> sounds like your job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so there, there, that is considered and, and may, Dina said it and I, it, some of you may not know that when she said it's important that everybody contributes a little bit, part of the tier <laughs> one is the number, the percentage of alumni that give back. Um, and that's why the even $10 piece was significantly important uh, because right now I think UTD is at three or four percent of alumni give back. Uh, and you, know, you get to the really big tier one schools and depending where they are, you know, they're at the sort of where we are at the 60, 70% level, maybe even more. Um, obviously we won't get the university to that point, but we really need to make strong statements of what, how we're doing and how we're doing. Yeah, I have a question that's kind of logistic and maybe more of it, um, you know, this project 100% that, you know, we've been talking about it for half a year or so now and, you know, it's the, the donations are starting to come in. Pretty soon we're going to be on fiscal year number two, and we're going to be going back to, you know, and, and um, I only ask because, you know, I, I've been contacting some of my classmates, and it's been, you know, it's been kind of a process saying, you know, have you donated, have you donated, yeah, I thought I donated, you know, do we have a ideas about how we're going to do this when, you know, fiscal year number two starts, and then we contact these people again, yeah, is that is that going to be the way that we do it? Are we just going to have class representatives contacting people every year saying, or is there some some better way that we can do that? At, at this, yeah, I think it's the way a lot of organizations do it is they annoy you even more towards the end of the fiscal year, make it very clear when that ends, um, saying you have until this period of being please donate this year. But going forward, I, I would imagine that's probably the plan. Did you have an idea? <laughs> So I don't have ideas. I just so, there are, <laughs> so you can set up recurrent PayPal accounts, things like that. Where, I mean, the the only problem then is if you, you know, donate ten dollars, and then the next year maybe you donate fifty dollars, you know. And so if you set up a recurring one year payment of ten dollars, you should be hassled to think about increasing it. But then you could have, because like Rich is saying, we don't want to see the bar graphs drop to zero. And then start slowly coming up. And it's like, who are the three people in my class that have this too? You know? And if we had everybody that just automatically made a payment on, you know, we could we could get people to sign up for even just the minimum on January 1st for the number and then badger people about the price or something like that. And one thing to consider is that in the first year is when it's going to be the most challenging because people are not accustomed to hearing from us. <laughs> so Benedict and I have split our class and we've got the same people each time. And um, next year, they, they know that this is happening. They, they're gonna, we're going to get into the routine of it, mm -hmm. and um, whether that's more annoying or less, yeah. um, at least they can anticipate it. And so okay. it's not reintroducing the alumni program, talking about what we're going to spend it on. Um, that's already been planned out. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a bit easier. Okay. Um, and I think we're it, within the um, association, we're getting better at figuring out how to do that efficiently. But the, the point is a good one, that we need to be mindful of when our fiscal year ends. And I'm donating regularly and forget each and like, oh, I thought I donated this year. Okay, did I donate right. this yeah, year? Exactly. Oh, shit. Uh -huh. So what making it more transparent year? to say, yeah. you donated this amount on this day. Right. Thank you so much for your contribution. We will get back in touch with you for the next contribution when fiscal year begins on whatever. And that's a good point, and, and Mike, I, to when that is. And I think that's September or <laughs> I, I think that's right. But it, the point is, it, I think we follow the university fiscal calendar. Um, I think that's yep. why we pick September 1st. Uh, university starts at the beginning of the fall semester, essentially. So when we're going through this process, we have to keep in mind that it doesn't overlap with people's <laughs> tax calendars. And so a lot of people are going to make contributions in December, uh, or they might make contributions in 
England um, and think that they've already given that here if we're asking for them in December. Even though it's a business issue, right? And Liz, probably to you, I mean, I think that's going to be a big part with recent graduates is, is making it very clear what's going on uh, and sort of maybe indicating that you sort of have a choice, but really it's just that good. Well, <laughs> I, was, I was actually going to say that because last year we always had our first, um, we had a ceremony at the end of the year called Lighting a Legacy where we all donated like a symbolic $20 and eight cent amount. And at the time, we didn't have an account for the Alumni Association, so it went straight to the university. But um, almost everyone, except one girl who broke her leg and wasn't there, gave the <laughs> game at the event. So that's actually, that's actually going to be a way that that first, that first, very first year, before they've even left campus, they will, you will have had 100% participation from the graduating class. And they are doing it this year. They are doing it this year. And I think so we're invited to this alumni as well, so if you have questions about that. <laughs> yep, yep, and then I think we should probably start with that. Wasn't there also discussion of challenge grants or something like that to try and motivate them? Yes, and that's, that's my point. I mean, we're going to keep hitting up our own alumni base, obviously, over the years, every year. Um, but my, at least my personal goal, and I think a lot of other people here, is to, in the next few months, to leave behind a very clear strategy on how it is not going to be the only source of funding or it's going to go way beyond that. And like I said, I'll talk a little bit about one of those ideas, and there are a host of other ideas as well uh, that Walt has been working on, different types of sorts of fundraising for different key funds. <laughs> you want to make an address? Yeah, I, just, I think super important. I think the best way to see people getting involved and putting their credit cards on this thing is people showing that they're actually doing the things that they want to do. And so we need to talk now about what the heck we do with this money that we've got. Great use of money. What are we going to do with it? Uh, something we've talked about, Dina and Mac and uh, Austin and I talked about in the grant committee. What we want to do is give the money back to motivated people, uh, campus people who have enthusiasm and passion for whatever kind of a project it is that they have, uh, but not enough money to make it happen. So if they have time and enthusiasm and no money, and we need some money, but neither time or this person. <laughs> <laughs> and so hopefully through this grant committee we can, dare I say, synergize those two things. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you, are you talking about something along the lines of how, I mean, I don't know if this will do it, but how, like the, uh, that's right. so the there was course and the, the mm -hmm. community garden, the that's Thinking Camp University, that's basically That's right. So, there was, uh, at one point, an alumni fund where uh, I think Ant used this for a couple of years and just wrote proposals to it and said, We have a good idea, but we're broke. Can we have some money? Um, and they talked about their idea and they got some money. Uh, we understand that fund is kind of fizzled, and so this sort of stood up that summer. Um, we're going to sort of go live with that now-ish and start the question proposals to people. We're going to make them ask, answer all kinds of questions. We're going to make them think about um, the funding, how much they would need, um, what they could do with double the funding, what they could do with half the funding, um, why they think we're a good source for funding, um, why they care about this sort of project. What are the questions that I have on the list? And there is, in your folder, there is a description of what exists so far in terms of the framework and oh, the go, yes. process. Would you say towns are part of the best one obligation? Well, that's that's what we're going to right now. Yeah. Yeah. It does matter. You're right, but but um, one of the things we need to think about is what we want to fund, and what we don't want to do is gild the lily. I don't want to pay for anyone's first class train ticket across France. Um, but what I would love to do is someone who is out there on a study abroad and recognizes a need to do something amazing with 500 bucks that they don't have, I would love for them to write a proposal and say, look, I'm in this place X. I can do this amazing thing with 500 bucks, and we can write in a check and make it happen. That would be, I think, fantastic. And that kind of thing, whether it's on campus or in Dallas or around the world, wherever you are, that's the kind of thing that's going to make people think, yeah, wow, I'm going to give my 200 bucks to the German alumni I know those guys, and I know they're working hard, they would do good proposals, and they're funding good things, and they're making a difference in good things happen. That's what I hope the Grants Committee is going to be. Um, we don't know how we're going to do it yet. We haven't done this before. The rules are all amorphous. It's all changing. People have great ideas. We want to hear about them. We want to make it the most effective thing we can do. We'll see. But the goal of all this is really to make the contributions become self-fulfilling, self-propagating, to make a good, good project result in more donations Jonathan, I think that was a good point you raised, that this can be a whole array of things. It can be a 
UPD project of the community garden. It can also be, I want to go to this conference to present my poster, um, but my lab won't sponsor me. Um, so it should be a very individualized piece. It should be a very large model proposal piece. Um, I think the Grant Committee would hopefully be open to, to lots of different suggestions. And we're not going to um, limit it to things that have broad appeal. We're not going to limit it to any so right now. Okay. I, I mean, so. there's no reason IT would limit it to anything. Um, it's going to, we're probably going to piss some people off by not funding some proposals, and we're probably going to fund some proposals that people think shouldn't be funded. But, you know, that's life. We're going to do our best to make sure we fund good proposals and do good things for the country. Do you have a target on how many you want to? We don't. Do? Um, I think the first year we were talking about a five, six thousand dollar proposal to play with, and I suspect from that, I'd, I'd like to fund <laughs> roughly five projects. Um, I don't see us doing any more than that. We may not get, who knows, we may get five applications. We might get 500 applications. And the plan does start to be rolling. Of oh, course, that's right, rolling papers. So I said on this uh, little piece of paper, which I sort of informally put together yesterday, that we start applications on March 8th. And so one of the reasons we did that is so that this weekend, sort of start to grease the wheels and start to talk to people. I've already been talking to the officers in D.C. and saying, look, you know, the alumni are out there. We're giving funds. We want you guys to make requests and make proposals so that we get more funds. We're going to impress upon the people that we gave the first grants to that they need to set the pace, set the bar high, so that it continues its funding cycle. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to make reporting a, a requirement. We're going to make it so that we have to put some <laughs> pictures and we put it on the website so we can tell you guys things we are committed to at the grant committee level. And then on the, on the funding question, I, I agree that it's good. And we've actually already internally had quite a few discussions on whether or not it could be part of our, our larger commitment. And that's our goal, is to make it well, part of our larger it's commitment. It's because it's $5,000 the first year, but we might have got 10 and it's a hard to fail. Absolutely. Exactly. Not. So yeah. the, goal, the goal is yes okay. for it to be part of our larger commitment. Sounds like a really good question. <laughs> 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 As far as a percentage of the contributed funds, I would be more okay with, with sort of allocating a larger percentage this year to the grants um, fund, I guess, than in future years, just to get the ball rolling. I mean, it's going to be super important that the first couple of things we fund are clear and laid out and neat, but they need to be clear cut. And for me, the, the focus here today is to let you guys know this is happening, uh, to get some preliminary thoughts, but please get involved. I mean, you're part of this, you're part of this committee, and everything else you've heard of today um, helps select those proposals. Uh, we're learning as we go, and we need everyone's participation. Any other comments while we're forward looking? Any last thoughts? Yes. Um, I, one question I think I asked earlier, but I think it would be all, to all of our benefit. When are the uh, next elections for the thinking about the board for next year? Uh, they're coming in, in March. In March? Yeah, the dates are in the bylaws, oh, when okay. we're supposed to uh, have the elections. Okay. And then one, I'm sorry, can I move over? Okay. And then um, I talked about ID, alumni ID cards, but just also to let you all know, I've been talking with Aaron, and we're trying really hard to get HR to allow us to use our alumni ID cards to get all of the common discounts. So um, there is a benefit to having these cards other than just for the university. We will get access to university, uh, some of the university sources, but as well area discounts. That would be really good. So again, I encourage you to do so. And then lastly, um, for those who haven't opened their folder yet, um, all of our contact information is on here. So, like, if there are things that we don't have time to talk about today, you guys can always just email us. You can always email the Dota Scholars and Commercial Alumni email. Or go to the website. If anybody wants an app of DotaAlumni.com email address, I can set that up. Pretty cool, right? Does anybody have something? I was just going to comment that for committees work, you don't have to be on the board. Um, we're excited to have people engage in a variety of capacities and the mentoring committee really excited about some people who know me, um, but just that it's not an obligation that we um, do so. And may I have your email? Yeah, I just have a question. I know you guys wanted to go with this, but um, what about ideal costumes and future I mean, have you thought about the people standing in the booth size? And that I want it to look extra local, like I want to bring it as extra local to there. Is that something you've thought about? Or? We haven't received any such requests yet. Not yet. Just coming out. Uh, but no, we haven't. I think it's a good point. And I think from my limited experience in this, usually if we're willing to give something, we just say it's okay. <laughs> 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 we 
but yes, that, that has been a discussion in our okay. board meetings. Okay. Um, at, at this point, I don't know that we have the funding no, to do like that, but yes, like in the future, years, hopefully yeah. we have yeah. enough funding that is being distributed appropriately so that if they say, I want this to be part of the grant proposal, then, then it can be there. So the larger the contribution, contribution, the more likely it would be. Yes. <laughs> Strings. And that brings us to a nice segue into kind of one of the, one of the ways to move into the future in terms of fundraising and support is an advisory council, uh, getting some key partners in the community, in the university, and beyond to advise us, really, um, to support us, and to, of course, and, and I'm using everything mm -hmm. here, to meet with the alumni association, to visit campus, <laughs> to donate, um, and to, to help us as we are so young. Uh, there are some people that um, have had experience with alumni associations before, that can help us, uh, guide us, what to do, what not to do, um, and so far, obviously, <laughs> is a key partner. Um, in all of this, uh, John Glenn Denny, we give you examples of the kind of people we've thought of so far, and then we are in the process of reaching out to. Mm -hmm. John Glenn Denny is a very close friend of the Mazzoni family, of Mary Coke, of Mrs. Mazzoni. And this is, this is a good, it's a perfect example. This is a, a man who's been very closely involved with his own alumni association for like 30 years. Um, this is also a person of significant influence and financial resources in Dallas. And this is a person who cares. He's impressed by what we're doing. He cares, obviously, for the Mazzoni legacy, and he's very close to the Mazzoni family. Um, so it is people like this, um, Chuck Eisen, I believe, or Sean, uh, to Jeff Fitz, if you want to tell them a little bit about it. Um, so, in my experience, uh, we went to visit the Eisen Center during our leadership in Dallas, and that's what Sam has been doing, Chuck has been doing, and they've been doing before. And he's always been a big supporter of the program, and having someone in the arts, especially in Richardson, primarily, someone who has had experience in business supporting the arts is going to be very beneficial for us from the culture standpoint of things because we have a lot of people who are very prominent in other fields but having someone who has his own performing arts center in Richardson like less than two three miles away will be very beneficial for the cultural aspect of having that someone in that corner of the QR. It is that kind of thing we've talked about well obviously you guys know them and again different roles for different people some of them have had a very close association with the program over time and also have the experience of their own alumni association like they do um, and then of course we're still we talked about a handful of more people um, and, and, and people in different key areas also throughout the city whether it's in the arts or in business or in education etc um, that's one of the strategies to start building a better a bigger foundation for the future beyond just us um, in closing, <laughs> next step, obviously, please stay in touch. That's the most important thing you can do for us. You need to stay updated. And your ideas are always welcome. Um, everything you've heard today is for somebody saying, hey, why, would, why don't we do this? And then running with it. Uh, so with that, I think 915, I'd also like to welcome and say hello to President Daniel, who joined us. Morning. Um, I was uh, a little concerned that nobody would notice and they would start saying things they shouldn't be saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for joining us.